John was going to be the lookout guy in the driver's seat. My uncle was in the passenger seat with the box on the floor, which only had flares in it looking like dynamite. I was going to be in the back passenger. I was going to tell John, hey, John, look it over here. You see somebody over there while John's looking? I was going to pull out my gun, shoot him in the back of the head. My uncle's going to pull out his gun, shoot him. We're going to torch the car. Go. Welcome back to another episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks. Make sure you hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. So, you know, New York, guys from Chicago, a lot of them originally came from New York. I mean, you know, guys like Capone, Paul Rica. I mean, there was a lot of guys uh, that came, uh, Johnny Torrio. Uh, they came from New York. And they when they came from New York, I would say they tried to per perfect the mistakes they were making in New York. New York, there was five families. They would fight a lot. In Chicago, there was only one family. Yeah. Uh, in Chicago, it was more of a criminal organization. So you had your your inner core who were made members, okay? And then you had a lot of associates, people that had a lot of stature in the Chicago mob, but they might have been Greek. They might have been Jewish. Um, and and um, they might have been Irish. But so they, they could never be a made member in that. Could be a made member, but they had a high-ranking role in this, you know, organization. It was about money. It was about so what they wanted to do in Chicago was eventually make a better life for your children. Not doing this like New York. This is our thing. We wanted to, you know, we wanted to grow. We want to bring our kids, and it was like, no, we're going to make a better life for our kids. That's why they got so involved with unions. They got so involved with legitimate businesses. To, 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 to make a better life for your children so they don't have to go through what you went through. Because basically in this life, they knew it. You're either going to die in jail or get killed, and you know you don't know how long you're going to last in this life. So yeah. it's not a good life. Mm -hmm. So now if someone's in New York and they're with a crime family and say they get banished from New York, can they go to Chicago and be inducted into that family? I don't, I, I don't know about that, okay? Um, I don't know of any instances, but I do know that even though it's two different groups, you still work together sometimes. So you might be from New York and I'm from Chicago. We have something going on maybe in New Orleans or something, you know, or some, an area that's not claimed for. A neutral place. Yeah, neutral. Or say we could... We can do a business somewhere. Say we want to go up to Milwaukee and, and you know, whoever was in control of Milwaukee, we, we might have to pay them a few dollars, you know. Yeah. We would do business together, but you couldn't, I, like, I couldn't go to New York and do business in New York somewhere without getting permission, which you probably usually wouldn't get unless you had to kick something back. So you don't want New York coming into Chicago territory, Chicago going into New York territory. But there wasn't this like fighting and all this stuff where, you know, there was there was a mutual respect. I mean, at one point before my time, you know, most of the stuff that I've seen or heard, you know, they were trying to make an organization across the whole country. Yeah. You know, and they were doing a good job of it, you know, at some point. So um, but from my understanding and anything <laughs> experiences, you can work together with somebody um, as far as somebody joining another family. I, I don't know of anybody that did. I don't know if you could or you couldn't. I, I, I would imagine that there's there's certain uh, protocol you got to follow. So um, who was the boss of the Chicago outfit when you were around? Um, so when I was young, I seen, you know, you seen some changes going on. But but the majority of the time that I was really involved, it was um, it was Joey Iupa. And then after Joey Iupa, when he went to prison, it was. I was told that it was shared by um, uh, Sam Carlisi, who was originally from Buffalo, I believe, and um, Johnny DeFranzo. And did you ever have any dealings with these people? Well, Johnny DeFranzo was from our neighborhood, so I knew Johnny well. Uh, Sam, I, I didn't really know. Um, so another thing in the Chicago mob is you don't really associate a lot with, with um, other mobsters. You know, a uh, big thing with my dad, with our crew was, you know, we're not going to go out. We're not going to hang. We're not going to do all this stuff. Once a month, we would meet at a secret location in the back of a restaurant or something and have a dinner just to relax, bullshit, have some fun. Yeah. Uh, but um, and prior to that, when I was young, it was uh, Tony Accardo. Tony Accardo was the boss. So um, I hear this thing called the Calabrese necktie. And your um, father made that famous. Well, 
people would say it in Chicago, but I mean, it's derived from the Sicilian necktie. So my father, over the years, we could pretty much diagnose him as a sociopath. You know, there were three parts to him. You know, when it came to being a father, he was great at one point. He, you, if you met him, he, you might love him, the good Frank. You know, then there was the street Frank, very street smart, very strict by the rules. And um, and then there was the sociopathic killer. My dad. Did he drink? No, he drank when he was younger. He stopped drinking because he didn't like the way he would get mean if he drank. And he didn't like that. Alcohol changed his personality. So he said, oh. if alcohol changes, if it's changed your personality, yeah. don't drink. So he might have one drink once in a while or one beer. Okay. Yeah. But, but he wasn't a drinker like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so I, my dad, his his signature trait of killing you, what he enjoyed was he would uh, strangle you with a rope. He liked hands on. Okay. And he'd strangle you. And once he knew you were dead, he'd cut your throat from ear to ear. So some people started calling it the Calvary's necktie. We never did. I never heard of it till later on. But it's derived from the Sicilian necktie. And that's what they do in Sicily, Sicilian necktie. Yeah. So when you were younger, did um did your father ever bring you on a mission like that? Well, I was um I would I started graduated in so I started graduating in the arson to physical violence with people to backing up my father when he had to send a message by hitting somebody or or like that and um and then I started planning and um I started planning and assisting with murder and stuff like that. So, yeah, but I was never there when my dad actually did that. You know, it got to the point where, uh, which I talk about in my story real quick, was there was a murder that was going to happen. A guy named John Ficarata, who was a family friend, and uh, a bunch of things had happened, and the bosses wanted him dead. So they gave the job to my dad and my uncle. John was very street smart and always carried a gun. My dad's concern was that, you know, he probably wouldn't get in the car with my dad and my uncle. So I had said, Dad, I'll do this. This is personal. This is against the family that made you this. Are you ready? Yes. So we Did you like the guy, though? Did you like him? Did I like the guy? Yeah. 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 I mean, he was he was nice, but I didn't like what he had done in the in the uh, prior to this in the last year. So he was changing, too, and he was doing a lot of things that were very out of his character. You know, and this guy was a very well-respected, very uh, seasoned mobster, okay, on Big Stoop. So this was going to be a very, very difficult job. And uh, that's when I stepped up and I wanted to do it. My father was hesitant at first, but he thought it was a great idea. And this is where I was going to, you know, cross that line. And like I talk about in my book and, and my tours and everything is, you know, my uncle stopped me from crossing that line. He said he would do it himself. He took the gun that I was going to use and use it as a backup gun. And he was in the car with John alone. And yeah. And, um, John caught. Oh, is that the one where he jumped out of the car and shot himself in the arm? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. you were supposed to pick him up. And I was supposed to be in the back seat on the passenger spot. And I was supposed wow. to make John believe that he was going to, um, that he was going to teach me that I'm there. I'm supposed to learn from you. You know, I was supposed to even tell John, John, you know, my dad says to pay attention to what you're saying, not what my uncle's saying, try to win him over. You know, he's going to help me groom me for, for this. And basically the ruse was that we were going to put dynamite by a dentist's office building to scare him into paying extortion money. That was the whole play there. Okay. And then John was going to be the lookout guy in the driver's seat. My uncle was in the passenger seat with the box on the floor, which only had flares in it looking like dynamite. I was going to be in the back passenger. I was going to tell John, hey, John, look at over here. You see somebody over there while John's looking? I was going to pull out my gun, shoot him in the back of the head. My uncle's going to pull out his gun, shoot him. We're going to torch the car, go. But being alone, that's how my uncle got shot. John was very street smart, caught the play. They started fighting in the car, you yeah. know, and, and even John being shot. And, you know, my uncle assassinated him in, in, in front of a bingo hall. And it was almost kind of direct, almost like exactly out of, the scene from Scarface, you know, where he ran out in the street. My uncle ran out in the middle of the street behind him as he was uh, staggering and shooting him in the back of the head. You remember this whole situation when this happened, right? So yeah, after I, your uncle major, I was in the background, I was to be contacted. I knew what I needed to do if anything went wrong. Yeah. So what was the situation after your uncle shot himself in the arm 
and he gets away, drops the glove and all that. Do you remember what happened next? Like, how did he take care of the wound and all that? Oh, yeah. Did he go yeah. to the hospital? Yeah, he got home. He, 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 he was supposed to be on a radio. Okay, we had radios. Uh, my dad and, and a guy named Johnny Monteleone were driving around the area. And they were. he was supposed to go you know, before he tried to shoot John and say, okay, the, you know, like the area is clear. You know, we're going to back the truck in and unload it now. We would say stuff like that in case somebody else was on the radio. And uh, uncle didn't, and he reached for the gun. So my dad and the other guy are driving around, and all of a sudden they hear sirens, everything's going on. Now they're trying to drive around looking for my uncle. Now, my dad and Johnny uh, Monteleone are in work cars. Work cars are what we use that aren't in our name that, you know, you can just get rid of. Yeah, crash cars. like uncle, crash cars, crash cars same thing. Um, my uncle got, uh, he, he actually on foot made it all the way to his home, which was about two, a good two miles away. So the reason, the way he lost the glove was because it was bleeding and it was, it was, I believe it was September and he had these black gloves on. So he, he, he went to a, a garden hose in a yard to wash off the blood and take the gloves off. He went to stick it in one of his pockets and one of them fell out. That's how they found the glove.